Um, Ryan has also recently taken up a leadership role at the university. He's, part of, he's a coordinator for Ohio University's Sustainable Administration Hub, so he promotes climate literacy to help OU, or Ohio University, the other OU, um, not Oklahoma, reach its sustainability goals on the climate side of things. So it's really awesome. So um, I won't go into too much detail. Ryan is originally from Ohio, did his bachelor's at Creighton University, his master's and PhD at Ohio State with David Bromwich doing Antarctic work, right? And uh, did a postdoc at NOAA's Earth System Research Lab in Boulder before joining Ohio University um, in 2010. Nine. 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 Nine, when I was an undergrad. And so Ryan's research focuses on Antarctic climate and sea ice variability. Um, I got to work with him as an undergrad on an NSF project looking at um, how the tropics influence Antarctica, and more recently he's been doing reconstructions, putting pressure and climate change in Antarctica in a historical context back to 1905, and that's what I'll be talking about today. Great. So thanks a lot, Ryan. All right, thank you. <clears throat> it's really great to be here today. Thank you so much for everyone coming out on a Friday afternoon and for inviting me out to Rutgers. That's my first trip out to New Jersey and to this uh, campus, and it's really, like I said, an honor to be here. So I'm going to be talking about some of my work that I've been doing over the last several years uh, at Ohio University. And before I do that, I think it's really good to kind of put it in my own context, so my own little story. Why did I get in interested and in, in, involved in this work? I began as a grad student. This is me, uh, my first deployment down to Antarctica uh, back in, geez, 2002, uh, when I had a lot more hair and you know, that, that smile on your face. Uh, and you're a grad student before your, your exams and you know you're, you're excited to go down to Antarctica for your first time, you know, before you had a mortgage and other life stresses, uh, that, that no worries kind of feel. And uh, I've been down to Antarctica three times uh, on different projects and doing work with forecasters actually down on the ice to understand the U.S. model that we use for forecasting our operations and how we can make that more efficient and uh, make less flights to get boomeranged and uh, to yeah, really reduce the cost of the program. And I, I've worked on some weather stations when I'm down there. This is me on the left here, and had really cool opportunities to go to different places working on the weather stations, and even that took me down to the South Pole. Uh, there's a story behind this picture that I'd love to talk over a beer or something, but you know, you don't typically wear blue jeans and, and uh, tennis shoes at the South Pole. Uh, it was, this is you know, a really cold day still, the South Pole, um, but how to get the picture, and so you, you run around and do what you need to do uh, to get the picture to, to happen. And when, when I think about Antarctica, that, 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 that trip got me, uh, a lot of Antarctic scientists call ice in the veins, where you have this experience where you are kind of changed from the inside out, and you want to learn more about this place that you fell in love with on your first step on the continent. And uh, it's a challenge when you're working in an Arctic climate. Uh, you think of global warming and global climate change and you see these great graphs that NOAA and uh, NASA put out every year and looking at the warming trends across the planet. And you, know, you see that, that 2018 was the th uh, fourth warmest year on record. And then you look at temperature trends like the IPCC puts out like this. But then you look in the Antarctica and it's a big white blob. And that's not just because it's ice. It's because we don't have data. We don't really know what the climate of Antarctica is like going back to 1901. Uh, there are not observations that go back in that part of the world that far back into time. And so correctly, uh, they don't put any kind of trend at all there because we just don't have data to represent that area. The Arctic is more sampled by comparison than the Antarctic. So what, what have we done to try to get into that data void and to understand what's going on? There have been several studies that have done temperature reconstructions of Antarctic climate to take observations that we have and fill in between them in different ways to get an idea of what the temperature patterns have been like back in Antarctica to 1957 or so. And so this one here is one from Nicholas and Bromwich, my former PhD advisor looking at the warming patterns over Antarctica. And indeed, Antarctica is not different than the rest of the world. There are parts of Antarctica that are warming quite rapidly, uh, largely confined to West Antarctica and the Arctic Peninsula. And there's a large seasonal uh, pattern to this variability in the warming. We only have one really station in West Antarctica that can collect long-term measurements, Bird Station. It actually isn't a continuous station. Uh, it existed for quite a while, then shut down. And then an automatic weather station was put in its place later on. 
And so it's not even a really good continuous record of a large geographic area where some of the warming is largest, we think, from, from the records that we have. So that paper went back and, and tried to patch in that record. Uh, and uh, the reds are here where they've done some patching statistically from different ways. Uh, and you can see at this location in, in West Antarctica that the warming is quite large. Uh, 0.47 plus or minus 0.23 per decade. Uh, compared to the global warming trend you know, over the 20th century, uh, it's 0.07. So we're, we're seeing a very large trend here. But there's a lot of variability still. It warmed early in the uh, you know, like this early part of the record is where the warming is the largest, and then it kind of leveled off. And if you look at it spatially even, there's some, there's some different parts of Western Antarctica that are warming more than others, and then there's a peninsula climate. It's quite different too, uh, east and west side of the peninsula even. So it's really complex and really diverse and challenging area. And of course, we don't want to know about Antarctica just because it's, it's interesting, but because it has global consequences. What happens in Antarctica doesn't necessarily have to stay down there. Uh, if it's melting sea ice, and it's, if that, uh, sea ice, if it's melting grounded ice, the ice sheet, uh, that can have a potential to raise sea level. We, the uh, Greenland, and this, this is a large story because there's a lot of rapid melting in the southern part of Greenland. Uh, Antarctica, by and large, is relatively stable. And this is from s satellites measuring really changes in the elevation, and they can convert that to uh, ice loss. But there's one area that we're seeing a lot of ice loss, and this is in West Antarctica. And some of the lower elevations and where water can get in here on this embayment, uh, call it the Amundsen Sea embayment. And uh, there are th many outlet glaciers that drain the West Antarctic ice sheet into this area. One of them is the Pine Island Glacier. And this is a pretty significant calving event of uh, some ice off that glacier in October into late November or mid-November of 2013, showing you that ice is breaking off of here. It's flowing out to sea. And that's melting then and raising sea level. Uh, and this, the story of these melting glaciers is not really an atmospheric problem, actually. Uh, even though there's warming going on above the surface, the warming isn't really creating enough uh, temperatures that are above freezing. The, the melting is actually happening from below, where circumpolar deep water here, represented by these red colors, is being pushed by the winds and uh, the waves up underneath the ice here, and I'll play that again, and melting these glaciers from below. And this is a potential to be like the worst case scenario because it, it's not really depicted very well in this diagram, but these glaciers are on bedrock that slopes downward. It's a bowl. And so the water can essentially keep funneling down underneath these glaciers and keep melting them from below and can keep contributing to sea level rise. Some scientists and glaciologists that are studying these glaciers may think that this change is irreversible. In fact, that we might continue to see rapid lo loss of these glaciers draining the West Antarctic ice sheet in this region. Uh, in time. And that, of course, has consequences for global sea levels. So the IPCC estimated that even though Antarctica is less than 10% of the global land mass, it is uh, upwards of 58 meters of sea level rise potentially from, the west, from Antarctica. About 15 meters or so might be from West Antarctica alone. A large part of that is in the larger and higher elevation of East Antarctica. And if you look at the maps of the IPCC, or the, the, the charts the IPCC put out for sea level rise, this is a very classic figure, and they, they, they show in the RPC, RCP 8.5 that warming is going to keep um, uh, sea levels to rise, and, and Greenland contributing to that, and other uh, parts of Antarctica are contributing to that, but with that estimate, it's less than one meter by 2100. But you have to read the fine print in these things sometimes, because there's a lot of detail in those. And so if you read the fine print on this diagram uh, in the IPC summary from policymakers, you'll see that it says, only the collapse of marine-based sectors of the Antarctic ice sheet, if initiated, could cause global mean sea level to rise substantially above the likely range in the 21st century. In other words, this data doesn't really include a lot of stuff that's going on in West Antarctica. It doesn't have a lot of information about the West Antarctic contribution to sea level rise. And if that were included, there could be a lot different numbers coming out by the end of the century for sea level. And uh, there's a lot of studies that are looking at this now. This is one of the earlier ones. And there's a lot of questions about this study. There's a lot of limitations and, and uh, some challenges with this study. But a lot of things that are learned in this study, uh, the way they accounted for the way that these glaciers are melting and the water is getting underneath them and they're, they're breaking off. And so a lot more glacier dynamics were included. And they suggested on this study that by 2500, if, if business as usual scenario continues on with greenhouse gases and warming, that West Antarctica can contribute over 15 meters by itself 
of sea level rise. And by itself, West Antarctica can contribute over a meter of sea level rise. And that almost doubles the estimate produced by the IPCC latest report. So a huge contribution from sea level rise here uh, in an area that Antarctica is rapidly changing. Why is it changing? <clears throat> this is where I get excited because these are oceanography and glaciology things which are a little bit more outside of my wheelhouse. Uh, but then you look at why they're changing and you'll see that the atmosphere and really changes in the atmospheric circulation are playing a very important role in that. Uh, so this is one, one study uh, that looked at some of these changes, looking at sea ice motion actually uh, in this study, but it drives home the pictures that I want to kind of get in your mind here. What's shown is sea level pressure trends by this color scale and the wind vectors are wind trends at the 10 meter level. And you'll see that there's three centers of action where the pressures are lowering uh, and one that is actually slightly raising here in the South Atlantic. And if you look at the wind patterns along these low pressures, uh, particularly the, the strongest trends here, uh, going from the peninsula of the Bellingshausen, Amundsen Sea, and the Ross Sea, you'll see that the, this uh, is actually leading to enhanced northerly flow uh, across West Antarctica and the Antarctic Peninsula uh, just by the circulation itself. And this is going to drive in warm air advection, more mar maritime, warmer air uh, in this region. It's also going to compact sea ice closer to the coast and allow for more water to be uh, near the, the coast of Antarctica. And that helps to warm the peninsula as well. And then this slight easterly flow uh, helps to with, aid with this, the flux of the circumpolar deep water into the Amundsen Sea embayment and melt the glaciers from below. And so the atmosphere, and particularly this atmosphere ocean ice interface right here in West Antarctica is a very critical thing to explaining these patterns of change. You can look at pressure change in a longer context, and this is a, an early observation study by Turner et al. in 2005, showing you pressure trends here for the annual mean and then the, the summer seasons from autumn through summer, and the significance is shaded uh, on the bars. And across all of East Antarctica, there are negative pressure trends, especially in the autumn season and in the summer season. And you can zoom in into one of these stations to get an idea of the challenges that we face when we look at these records. So this is Casey in East Antarctica. And if you look at the time series of the summer pressure, December through February, uh, from 20, 1960 to 2014, you see this downward trend. That pressure is deepening. The, 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 the lows that are coming around the coast and influencing the station are stronger. And it's a significant trend over its full record. But the challenge that you face, again, is that this record starts in 1960. And it's not alone. Almost all of Antarctic records at the surface for the, the observations that we have for meteorology are at 1957 or so. There are just a handful of them that go back farther than that. And so we have a challenge in understanding what's causing this change, even though we know this change is very important for what we're seeing with ice in the ocean uh, and the winds, we don't know how unique this change is or what's causing this change because we don't have a very long history to appreciate this change. We could be part of a natural cycle or it could be part of the ozone depletion uh, forcing or other things that are going on in the climate system. So what is my research going to tackle this problem? So I wanted to try to convince you the rest of the time here that we're doing some exciting things to help with understanding more of the uniqueness of these long-term trends. And it's quite simple, actually. We are taking these observations of pressure and reconstructing them, extending them back into time, uh, using uh, not paleo data. We're not using ice cores or ocean sediments or anything like that. We're just simply using other pressure records from the mid-latitudes of the southern hemisphere to make these records twice as long as what they are from the real data that they're collecting on the ice. And we're going clear back to 1905. How are we doing that? I'm not going to go into the detail of the methodology uh, in this part of it, but we have 18 different stations that we're looking at that have decent long-term records across Antarctica. They're confined, there's a lot of them in the peninsula region because it's more accessible and uh, th there's just other logistics that help support more stations there and a lot of different countries are involved with that. There are very few in the interior and a lot of coastal stations, especially in East Antarctica. And what we're doing is we're matching those stations up statistically, developing a statistical model to relate pressure here in the mid-latitudes with stations that go clear back through the 20th century and beyond many of them uh, to understand pressure variability in Antarctica. And this works fairly well because the mass of the atmosphere is constrained. And so that if there are pressure variations at the South Pole and over Antarctica, they're going to be offset and represented by some extent by pressure variations in the mid-latitudes. And there's this nice natural statistical link uh, between pressure in Antarctica and pressure in the mid-latitudes. 
And we just needed to tap into that link. Uh, we developed a model. We, we refined a model that's used for widely for temperature reconstructions across the US and, and globally called principal component regression. And rather than just using all of these stations, we take subsets of these stations or we take patterns between these stations, how they're related to each other, and use those as predictors for the past climate uh, of these stations in Antarctica. And we do a pretty good job of it, especially in the summer. So here are various measures that you can validate a reconstruction. Calibration correlation is just how does that reconstruction compare to actual data during the period of overlap. You went close to one. Validation correlation is a method that you use to validate a reconstruction to see how well does it match up with some other independent data. Either data that you withheld during the reconstruction period, or in this case, data that we, we actually did uh, in an independent way. We predicted years independently and then added them, those together to get a full independent time series. That you want to be a close to one as well. The reduction of error and coefficient of efficiency are more of a comparison to how well you do against the climatological mean. And those can go as bad as negative infinity or uh, as good as perfect, like what should be one. Anything above zero for those two statistics indicates that you're outperforming the climatological average and you're adding knowledge to the prediction. Okay? And so in our summer, across all 18 stations, we have calibration correlations that never dip below 0.7, uh, validation correlations that are always but 0.6, and these are pretty high, in fact, really good uh, RE and CE skills. If you've done any kind of reconstructions, you, you know that getting a, an RE and CE above uh, 0.6 is, is really great. Um, so you can look at this spatially and see the calibration correlations at different stations. Uh, this is during the period of overlap. And the peninsula, we do tend to do the best uh, because we're closer to South America. We also have a, an observation out here called Orcatus. That's the longest continuous record south of 60 south. It goes clear back to 1903. And so it's close proximity to these Antarctic stations allow us to get really good skill. Esperanza, uh, we have correlations above 0.9 with, with our reconstruction and the observations there. And then still in the summer, decently well across the, the Antarctic continent. And so we're able to extend these records much farther back into time and get something that looks like this. Uh, on the left here is Halley Station. It's in West Antarctica near um, zero degrees. And here is at Murney Station. I show these two to be completely transparent. This is our best. <laughs> And this was our not as best, uh, I won't say least skillful, it's just the one that has the lowest values. Uh, and you compare it to the observations in black here and our reconstruction and a confidence interval, an error window around that reconstruction. You can see we match up with Halley record almost perfectly. It's really quite remarkable using pressure records all, all really far away, uh, oceans away, and, and getting a good record there. Uh, at Murney, uh, not as good, but overall still capturing the variability, 0.84 for the correlation uh, with the record there, and the statistics there are, are still pretty good. The, the, the CE is a little lower, but still adding a lot of skill beyond the um, climatological mean. Now this is, this is some of my early work on this project that was what I was doing, and I, we got to this point, we were really excited about these really good reconstructions that doubled our observations, and we were looking at them in a little more detail, and we looked at the, these spikes that we didn't know existed before because we didn't have any data. And we saw this one that appeared in almost every single reconstruction in the summer. Uh, and this is a spike that happened in 1911 and 1912. Uh, does anyone happen to know what 1911, 1912 was in the history? Race to the pole. Race to the pole. Yeah, absolutely. And so we were like, oh my gosh, this is during the height of polar exploration uh, when Amundsen and Scott were forming a journey to the South Pole. And we saw this new, really large signal in all these records that were like, we got to investigate this a little bit more. And so I uh, talked to Susan Solomon, uh, who has done a lot of work on this and written books on uh, Scott and his expedition to the South Pole. I'm like, I had this really cool result. Do you want to look into this with me? And she's like, yeah, absolutely. And we published a paper uh, that appeared in BAMS in 2017. This is the tag. I'm going to give you the, the take home here. And then I'll show you this. This is true. That not only was there interesting weather at the end that might have been a factor in Scott's death, uh, but during the summer itself, there was an exceptional summer uh, marked with really above average pressure conditions and really above average temperature conditions uh, that both polar parties experienced. So this is a famous picture of uh, the Scott Polar Party at the South Pole after knowing that they've been defeated by Amundsen by about a month. It's the first polar selfie. Uh, here's Bowers. You can, can't see it very well, but there's a string here he's using to pull the camera. 
uh, and takes a picture of the five uh, crew there that made it to the South Pole. Unfortunately, they all perished uh, on the journey on the way back. Uh, this is Scott here himself. Uh, this is Evans, who was the first to perish, and then Oates here, and then Wilson and Bowers. And if you look at this reconstruction with the observations from the field party, so Cape Evans is from the British party, and Framheim is from the, the Norwegian party, and compare them with our reconstruction, here in the summer, I was so excited that I did not use any of this data, that we were within a tenth of a millibar uh, of their observations and my values. So that little spike that we saw matched perfectly uh, with the actual data that they collected during their expeditions. And I'm like, we gotta, we gotta keep going with this. And we looked at other pieces of data. Now, these aren't as reliable perhaps, but these other gridded products that go back through the 20th century all showed this bump upward as well. And so we're thinking there's something going on really interesting. Let's dive into the, all of their data. And so I had some undergrads and some other people and my, my research team look at the data. And they spent quite a bit of time typing and digitizing all of the log books and the journals and the data from these records throughout the whole expedition. And then we looked at it in comparison to climatological data. So at McMurdo, we have a daily record that goes back uh, to 1957. And so we're comparing the daily mean record uh, from 1957 through 2017 uh, here in red, black with the two standard deviation range of the daily values at McMurdo with the values that were experienced by these polar parties while they're still on the Ross Ice Shelf, what they called the barrier back then. And you'll, you'll be drawn to that really high anomaly there that basically there are records that were set um, by both of these parties um, that were not ever observed in McMurdo data uh, at the daily time scale. So these daily mean values at Cape Evans, at Framheim, and even their sledging journeys as they're moving away from the bases and still on the barrier, the Ross Ice Shelf, that were just really, really high. And we looked at the temperature data and we noticed that, that during those times, especially in December, when they're experiencing these above average pressures, they're also recording temperature anomalies when you compare them to air interim reanalysis, uh, matched for the location wherever they were on, on their journey. Amundsen's in particular, uh, for several days there in early December, he, his crew experienced temperature anomalies above 10 degrees Celsius from the long-term average uh, as they're making their way up onto the polar plateau. Uh, this is uh, Scott's here. Scott's also experienced temperature anomalies. They were at that point uh, still on the Ross Ice Shelf, but of five degrees Celsius above uh, average. It worked out not so good for Scott. Um, Amundsen was on the plateau at this time, and he experienced a very dry, warm snow and uh, a little bit of fog, and it didn't delay him at all. And so he was able to make a great journey and actually wrote several times in his diary about how, in, how we thought it would be a lot colder. <laughs> yeah, and like, well, you're, you're having record warmth there. So you're a little misled by that one particular year. Unfortunately for Scott, you can read in his diaries and he was miserable. Uh, he was having record warm or really high warm too, but because he wasn't onto the continent yet, uh, he was still on the Ross Ice Shelf, uh, he had a heavy wet snow that basically made them camp out inside their tents and didn't make progress for several days. And they were wet and miserable and he complained about it quite a bit. So it worked against Scott and worked for Amundsen. And you can look at Amundsen's data, data and because there, there's only three points of data taken every day from these sledging parties. And so, you know, are we really getting the daily mean? Uh, so we, we plotted the max value from Amundsen and we compared it to 10 minute data collected from uh, a weather station near the South Pole, Henry AWS, uh, that goes back to 1993. And so we have, you know, millions of points of data here with 10 minute data to see if that AWS ever recorded something as warm as what Amundsen was experiencing. And the answer is in that part of December, not really. Uh, in fact, those two days that Amundsen experienced were some of the warm, were the warmest that that uh, record has ever had. We compared it to South Pole daily data. It's also off the charts for that record. And so they had really, really warm conditions that corresponded with those really high pressure anomalies. A really interesting uh, find that we had no idea was part of this uh, uh, really exciting time in polar history. <clears throat> okay. So we took these pressure reconstructions then and we went another step farther. We were like, we have really great data, but it's still limited because it's only at these 18 locations. What's going on across the entire continent? And can we say more about what's going on once we have that? Because looking at 
what's causing changes at individual locations can get a little dangerous. There's a lot of things that can influence pressure variability at one location that might not be a large scale forcing. And so it's hard to attribute changes at that individual station level. But if we have a bigger picture, we might be more likely to uh, understand some of these, these changes better. And so uh, the next part of this project was to basically uh, extend this across the entire continent. Uh, we were going to use REGEM to do this, a really more advanced statistical and filling method, but we found that Krigging actually works quite well. And so uh, we, we modified it um, to use a, a slightly more optimized version of the standard Krigging algorithm, uh, represented by this equation here. And I'm going to break it down for you, uh, at least in important parts of it. So we have here a matrix of all the correlations between uh, the stations. This is actually a, a fairly in, important part of this, this optimized model because we're now looking at how all these 18 stations are related to each other. Uh, so it's like a, co a covariance or correlation matrix between the stations. Uh, and on the other end of the thing, we have how are each of those stations related to every single grid point that we're trying to fill in. That's what's a normal part of a creating algorithm is this station's footprint with every single other point in the grid. This extra piece here to say, okay, we actually need to also include the relationships between the stations because if we do that, we minimize the risk of overfitting or providing too much information to this Kriging algorithm. Once you have both of those matrices, we can get this idea of the lambda star here, which is the optimized Kriging weights. Uh, and to get that, we can simply, these are linear systems equations. We can simply invert matrix A, solve for lambda star, and plug it back into the weights here for Kriging and use that to fill in the whole grid. And because we're basing these on our individual pressure reconstructions, we're now getting a spatial pressure reconstruction uh, back to 1905 uh, over the entire Antarctic continent. So how, is it, how well does it match up with air interim? I did not use, uh, all, only thing I used from air interim was, was a gridding uh, and a relationship between points. So uh, otherwise it's, it's, it's fairly independent of air interim. And you'll see that the match with air interim data here is, is really quite remarkable. These are squared correlations, not just the calibration we squared them. So 0.7s are actual correlations above 0.8 uh, with air interim data. In the peninsula here, and what I'll see, we have correlations that are uh, above 0.9. In terms of our mean absolute error, what's the average dif difference um, between the air interim values and our values? We're within uh, a millibar, a millibar and a half in, pl in places. So really, really good fit. Yes? All right, just a quick question. On the correlations, what's the time scale of the time series that you're... Yeah, we're correlating from 1979 to 2013. So it's one value at each location for each winter. Summer, summer yes. Winter. Yeah, summer. so yeah, about 30, 30 mm -hmm. uh, individual values. Okay. Yes. Uh, the skill drops uh, as you move off the continent, which is expected. Uh, there's a lot of variability in the Southern Ocean. We have no data at all in our reconstructions to constrain that. And so we're, we're not really getting a Southern Ocean reconstruction here of pressure. We're getting an Antarctic continent, which was our goal. Uh, I've tried uh, that Amundsen C feature, which is so critical and important. I've tried different ways of trying to re reproduce that uh, back into the time with no success. Um, so it's just, it's highly variable and very noisy, and there's not enough data nearby to give us a good uh, statistical fit. But over the ice shelf and the ice sheet, we're doing uh, a lot better. And now we can start to match this up in other ways with air interim. So this is the trends of pressure that we see uh, in air interim, uh, which is like observations. It's, it's constrained by observations. And then our reconstruction, which just takes 18 points, uh, and fills in gaps, and there are actually reconstructions of those points, they're not actual data. So you can see that the pattern and even the magnitude is very well represented. Again, not so great uh, as you move farther off into this, this pressure rise here because our, our, we don't have data out in the Southern Ocean there to constrain it. But over the continent itself, we have a pretty good match of the pattern uh, and uh, the fit there. And so we think we can go back now a lot farther and look at pressure over time. So to do that, I'm going to first show you time series with area averages. Uh, this blue outline sector here will be the East Arctic sector, at least for this purpose. Uh, the green out here for the peninsula, and then this red box sector, sector will be West Antarctica. And here are the time series of those locations going back now through the 20th century. Air interim is in blue, my reconstruction in black, a smooth version for the low frequency variability in red. Uh, the correlations with error interim are above 0.9 in every single domain. Uh, even higher in uh, the Antarctic Peninsula, we have more data and, again, better skill with our reconstruction. So we have a really good record uh, that matches up with the observed, our best estimate of pressure throughout the latter part of the 20th century, error uh, interim. 
and goes back into time. And you can see in these things too, uh, the spatial reconstructions that blurb in 1911. 1925 was another interesting year related to El Nino and, and a negative SAM index, uh, like 1911, 1912. But you can see uh, a really good fit. Now, is this better than what we had before? I like to think so because if you look at other gridded data sets that go back into time, these are two widely used, era 20C and 20th century reanalysis in red. <coughs> Uh, they fit okay during the last the time period of overlap with the area interim, 1979 and onward. The correlations with our reconstruction with these guys is pretty good. Uh, a little lower for the 20th century analysis. It's a little coarser. Um, but when you go back into time, you notice that these drift quite substantially and that the pressure values uh, get a lot higher as you go back in both of these data sets. In, in fact, in 20th century uh, uh, era 20C, you can have pressure anomalies that approach 15 degrees uh, 15 degrees, 15 uh, hectopascals <coughs> uh, in the summer. That just seems really almost a physical. It's really, really, really large. And uh, yeah, it, it, if you were to do a trend on these earlier reanalyses and look at the pressure trend over the 20th century, you would just see this really intense deepening of pressure over Antarctica, which we believe to be artificial. They still have data to constrain them, and so they're kind of drifting into their model climatology and uh, not really giving a, a really good representation. We've also compared this in other work that I'm not going to present to um, some non-coupled climate models uh, in different ways and uh, found that it, it matches up with that uh, fairly well. And so we see this, this pressure um, being a pretty good estimate of what was happening throughout the 20th century. And so with that, we can investigate what happened in the 20th century. So. Uh, I'm going to use the same contour interval for the next slide, and that's why it doesn't look like there's very many contours on this plot. There'll be many more later. Uh, but over the, the full 20th century, from 1905 to 2013, uh, the new thing that we came out with this study is that only in East Antarctica are we actually seeing significant changes in pressure. The stipling here indicates where those pressure uh, trends emerge from the noise, and the 95% confidence interval doesn't intersect zero. So we see a significant deepening of pressures across East Antarctica, but not in the peninsula or West Antarctica. And that was a really interesting and new result because we didn't have data going back into that time that we could trust to give us an idea of what was causing that change. Why only East Antarctica? It has to do with what happened in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, partly because of the high pressure values in 1911 and 1925, but also because of some lower values in the beginning of the 20th century, the whole Antarctic continent was marked with pressure increases during the early 20th century that reached levels of statistical significance in the South Atlantic sector, moving across uh, here near the Ronnie Filchner Ice Shelf and uh, out here into the South Pacific that we did not even know anything about before. We think this is related to tropical variability and um, some t teleconnections from the tropics and uh, this predominance of El Nino events that tend to match with negative SAM events and give this uniform negative pressure anomaly, uh, above, sorry, above average pressure anomaly across the continent. And with that through time, gives this pre positive pressure trend. <clears throat> we can then compare it to the recent values. So observations are now plotted on this because they start to come in in 1957. And so you can see our reconstruction matches up fairly well with the observations. Uh, and that pattern of now the, the really strong falls of pressure in the South Atlantic sector is starting to emerge as well as over the Ross Ice Shelf. And that pattern then matches and amplifies what I already showed you before. And our, and it fits, our reconstruction fits really well with the observations. Uh, so this negative pressure trend here is largely in part because of the really high pressure values that marked the mid 20th century uh, in the summer in this part of uh, South, the South Atlantic sector uh, of Antarctica. And you can look at 30-year running trends to understand the temporal variability of these, these pressure val values. So these are trends plotted at 30-year intervals. This is the starting year of those 30-year windows. Uh, and then the 95% confidence interval of that trend. There's the area interim trend. This is all we had from gridded data that we could trust, uh, which shows a significant trend. Uh, if you put that in context, that, that significant trend started around 1970. Once you go back before that, the trends are insignificant, um, but uh, over the whole continent, uh, positive for much of the 20th century. You can break this down into sector and so and also through time. So this, this figure has a lot going on. Uh, this is a starting year of a trend, and this is the ending year. 
This horizontal line is exactly 30 years, so it's that time series up there. And then as you move down into the right in each of these plots, you move into longer periods. So the bottom right corner is the, the full 20th century trend from 1905 to 2013, uh, and then you move into shorter periods. And what you see is that this, this negative trend uh, only emerges once you, um, in the time series after 1980, uh, before that, uh, they are, there are positive trends. They reach some level of statistical significance near the peninsula. The area averaging here is not matching up with the spatial plot, and so that's why you don't see it significant uh, in either West Antarctica or Antarctic Peninsula. But there, there's clear indication of positive trends uh, throughout the 20th century before 1980, and then these negative trends after that. So there's a unique forcing perhaps going on uh, that we now have a better context for with these reconstructions. <clears throat> so if you want to understand forcing, you have to use modeling. And so we added this modeling piece to our study, uh, collaborating with scientists at NCAR. And we looked at a non-coupled uh, CAM5 ver uh, version of their, their atmospheric model. And we, we ran three simulations that span the whole 20th century. One that only include forcing from ozone depletion as the only uh, time varying uh, product. So the ozone hole was there uh, and that, that effect was prescribed in the model. Uh, then we had uh, another one that had no radiative forcing, including no ozone hole, but tropical SSTs. To understand me what the tropics are doing uh, using EIRST uh, data set for the sea surface temperature variability and with radiative forcing fixed. <clears throat> Then we did a combination study, essentially, where we added radiative forcing, uh, including greenhouse gases now, plus the tropical SSTs. Uh, we didn't do, uh, in this particular uh, study, global SSTs because, A, we don't have data near Antarctica uh, going back to the full 20th century, and sea ice is also very important. We don't have sea ice data either. So uh, we, in this case, we just use climatological sea ice and climatological SSTs outside the tropics. <clears throat> and so with this idea, even with these three, th three simulations, we can still get a good idea of what's causing some of this variability throughout Antarctica back into time. So first we'll look at ozone. Uh, here is my reconstruction in black and the air interim data in blue. And then green is the average of 10 ensemble members to get that forced response. And the gray shading here is the range of all those ensemble members in terms of the 60 to 90 south area average pressure. Here on the right is a spatial plot of that pressure trend uh, from 1957 through 2013 in the model. <clears throat> and so we can zoom out now and include the mid-latitudes and see the full pattern and where the pressures are falling uh, there. And that pattern matches fairly well with what we see in our reconstruction, you know, with the, the pressure falls in South Atlantic and over the Ross Ice Shelf. And we get a broader pattern and see this is projecting onto the southern annular mode uh, with pressure rises in the mid-latitudes and these falls in the the high latitudes. <clears throat> and if you look at the ozone forced response here, the green line, you can see that that also is falling uh, after 1950 or so. And that tells us that there's a, ne a negative pressure trend in this ozone simulation, that ozone forcing is leading to a pronounced negative pressure trend over Antarctica. This is not new. Uh, a lot of su studies have shown that there's a summer response to ozone depletion uh, in Arctic, Antarctica. We're adding to that a climatological perspective and showing how that, that varies through time and how unique that recent forcing is. <clears throat> uh, yeah, and the, the trends over the continent also match fairly well and their significance uh, and it's, it's consistent with our reconstruction. If you look at the tropical SSTs, excuse me, with no rating of forcing in this one, so no ozone depletion, no greenhouse gas increases, uh, you'll notice some things that really surprised us. That the trend is weaker overall in the green line, but there's this notable uh, dip here at the end uh, that is consistent with our reconstruction. And in fact, it's the only experiment in all of the model experiments where the ensemble mean consistently falls below zero for a prolonged period of time. Uh, and, and if you look at the spatial pattern, they still have that projection uh, onto the southern annular mode, roughly, with pressure rises in the mid-latitudes and these decreases over Antarctica. And it explains the, the, the spatial pattern a little bit better with isolated deepening here in the Ross Ice Shelf and the South Atlantic sector. So we suggest in this paper that tropical SSTs are actually needed even in the summer season to explain some of the recent negative pressure trends. 
And that was an, a fairly new result. Everyone was just thinking that ozone depletion was the primary mechanism. We're adding to the story and saying, we actually need to account for tropical SSTs as well to get that recent deepening. If you look at um, tropical SSTs plus all the radio forcings, we get the best fit, not only with the observations, but spatially as well, uh, which is naturally what we expect. <clears throat> Now, you can put these all together, and this is, so this is the, the, all three of those that I just showed you. And I do this to show you that there's some linearity to this, which is really surprising. Uh, if you take this plus this, you end up with the, the total sum of uh, tropical SSTs plus the radio forcing together. And because there's some apparent linearity between them, we can go a little bit farther and tease out some more forcing without even doing extra simulations. So, let me walk you through this. Okay. Over here on the left are the same plots I just showed you, the ozone-only simulation, tropical SSTs, and the, the combined. They're just in different order. Uh, the model ensemble mean now is in the black, and my reconstruction is in blue. <coughs> if we want to look at uh, ozone and tropical, what they do by themselves together, we can take these two uh, time series and sum them up. And this is the correlation. You should see that we get an improved correlation here, a better fit and they capture these low values that we see in, in the, the reconstruction and the pressure over Antarctica later. So a pretty strong fit with just two things by themselves. We didn't have a simulation that included just those two. <clears throat> we can go a little bit farther and say, what if we look at uh, rate of forcing without ozone? So like greenhouse gases or other mechanisms. Um, so the way to do that would be taking the, the combination forcing and subtracting out the tropical SSTs. We come up with this here, which doesn't uh, show as good of a fit. And in fact, you can see that without uh, tropical SSTs, we actually lead to pressure increases uh, in the last 10 years or so. And so tropical SSTs are again important for having that recent negative value at the end of this time series. And then just for fun, we can go even a little bit farther. Like, what about without ozone altogether? So this has ozone depletion. What about just greenhouse gases or other things um, by themselves? So to do that, we can take this plot, subtract out the ozone, uh, and come up with this end result here. And you can see that there's basically no fit at all to our reconstruction, or there, there's not much match in the forced response in the model with our, uh, our reconstruction, uh, which suggests that greenhouse gases don't really do a lot uh, in the summer. Uh, and we're not seeing a, a really strong response yet from those. They're being overwhelmed by tropical SST variability and green, uh, ozone depletion. Uh, and so that's a weakened response there. We do see one thing. Uh, and so this, this, this spike here uh, that may be related to volcanic activity is close to the Agung eruption uh, in 63 that may have uh, led to that pre positive pressure anomaly. It's consistent and robust across all ensemble members. Uh, it wouldn't be, it's too short-lived to be uh, a, a greenhouse gas signal. Um, so we think it might be some uh, radiative response from, greenhouse uh, from a volcanic eruption, but it's really hard to tease that out from the model. Uh, and we haven't had any success. <clears throat> all right, so what about the other seasons? I have done all the other seasons besides summer. I spent most of the time talking about the summer because it's the best season that we have for the re reconstruction skill. And therefore, we're going to say the most with most confidence. Uh, but we have looked at all the other seasons. And the reconstruction skill dips uh, as you move away from summer for lots of different reasons. Uh, but we still have pretty good matches. And what we've done here is now looked at uh, our reconstruction and correlated it with uh, the CAM5 simulations. And uh, that these are spatial correlations of these patterns over different time periods, the beginning of the 20th century, middle of the 20th century, when we see that positive pressure anomaly in all seasons, and then the end of the 20th century, where we start to see the pressure falls in the summer. So this is the left. I kind of went through this detail here of what we see. The stars indicate that um, the uh, match is best when the ensemble mean is included. So the force response is playing a role. In the other ones, the uh, ensemble mean is removed. So we're actually just looking at variability, not a forced response. And these are done, by the way, at the individual ensemble mem member level. We looked at 90 different ensemble members. Uh, so we're not looking at, it has the forced response plus variability. Uh, because we think you know, the, re the reconstruction is a, is a blend of that. It's the forced response plus real world variability, right? All right, so I'm gonna focus on the other seasons besides summer just to finish up here. If we look at the fall, uh, you notice that there's an asterisk here in all these plots indicating that the ensemble mean needs to be retained to get a good fit with the reconstruction. 
In fact, we get the best fit um, almost always when we include that ensemble mean. Uh, and these uh, ensemble members all include tropical SSTs as a, as a major forcing mechanism. Uh, and so we think tropical SSTs are playing an important role of these patterns throughout the, the fall as well, including the, the deepening of the Amundsen Sea Low that we're seeing in the fall season. Uh, we think that this is a nice tropical pattern and our reconstruction would support that. And so there's some role of tropical variability with maybe some role of ozone. Uh, we can't rule that out, uh, but uh, uh, certainly a, a re response from tropical SSTs. When you move outside of the autumn and into the winter and the spring, uh, it's a lot messier. Our reconstruction's a little worse. It's not as good uh, as matching with the real data. And the model uh, is, is, is different too. And so the forcing is just weaker. Uh, and so we don't see any, uh, the matches are lower here uh, with the reconstruction and the model. And we never see a match, the best match be with the, the ensemble mean retained. And so we think there's just a lot of natural variability going on in the winter and the spring. Uh, ups and downs that are occurring naturally, not related to greenhouse gases, not related to ozone depletion, um, and not even strongly tied to tropical SSTs over a, a, a long time period uh, that we're seeing in the model <clears throat> there. Okay, let me wrap up here and then I'd be happy to answer questions. So, hopefully I convinced you that seasonal reconstructions of Antarctic climate back to 1905 are possible and we can double the length of observations and triple the length of the reanalysis products that we trust to get a much better context of these interesting changes that are going on. And from these reconstructions, we can see that the South Atlantic sector is really interesting. It was marked by positive pressure trends in the early 20th century and then rapid pressure falls after uh, the 20th century. If you look at the mid 20th century, after, if you look across the whole continent, only East Antarctica shows uh, persistent negative pressure trends uh, that are significant uh, in the summer. These things are, are, are related to both ozone depletion as a primary mechanism and tropical SSTs and potentially volcanic activity, but we can't uh, tease that out yet. And then if we look at in the other seasons, the autumn season may also have this forced response. A lot more work needs to be done in this season to, to really um, pick this out, tease this out some more. But uh, we're seeing uh, the evidence of tropical SST is also playing a role in this season, an ongoing change too. Okay, thank you guys so much. <laughs> yeah, then. You may have said it and I missed it, but what, what do you consider the tropics? Where, where were the tropical SSTs between what latitude? Yeah, I might have actually had it in that slide. If I can go back, I think it's 25, and then it's dampened, tailored, tempered. Up. Whoop. I don't have it on this slide. Okay, uh, I think it's like 25 north and south. So this is a we run it globally, um, and then we dampen it linearly to about 30, I think, and then rest are prescribed a seasonal cycle. Because I guess I was wondering, like, how much more if you went maybe 45 south. Yeah, we, we worry about the data quality yeah, moving yeah. yeah through the 20th century, especially the early 20th century. Even in the tropics, we're still worried about it. Sure. Uh, I'd love to do that because we're not really getting the IPO or the PDO. Uh, and we know that those have an important role in recent change. And the slower part of INSO that we're, we're only part ca capturing by looking at the equatorial, equatorial tropics. Uh, yeah, and it'd be interesting to do that. Uh, we did look at one GOGA simulation here, but again, the skill of that data back into the time, um, we're not sure. Yeah. A challenge. Yeah, you always want to do data quality issues the farther back you go. <clears throat> yeah, please. So, can I ask you about the there's an anomaly in your um, observational record right at the beginning, right at like in the late 50s, and just very deep uh, low followed by your high. Yes. Because you were picking out stories from the earlier record that you know, got happening. What's, what's happening like, in, the late, in the late 50s? I mean, it looks like it, right, you basically go to a low as you were today and then start to. Yeah, so, yeah, th that might be some of that volcanic signal um, that we're thinking might have been related to that. Uh, some of the earlier work. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, certainly the, the transition, yes. Uh, a really rapid response like that over the whole continent. We see it in every season, we see it in every location, uh, which suggests some large, large forcing. Uh, it does, does appear in many of the model simulations that include tropical SSTs, so there might be uh, some pattern, but I, I didn't, it's not like really strong El Nino, La Nina timing there, so. What, what that's coming from, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, 
but yeah, there might be some kind of volcanic signal. Mark? Um, I, I guess what, what, I was a little surprised by the radiation calculation because you, you had, um, you showed, you know, a decline in, in pressure sort of, a, you know, in modern times especially. And I, I sort of equated decline in pressure with a, you know, more lows. And you actually mentioned that little stronger activity in, on, on the storm side of things. But uh, to, I'm still trying to reconcile how I could see water vapor with those increased lows. You should have more water vapor, I would think. And yet that still doesn't equal, it's still less than the ozone effect. That's, that was surprising. It must just mean there's not very much water vapor at all. Yeah, it's, that, it's, it's rather limited. You know, um, in the summer is a little bit better because it's warmer and there's more open water. Uh, that can supply, but these these systems are rather shallow. They're not as deep as mid-latitude cyclones. Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. Um, yeah, it's just it's just colder too, and so the the latent heating from water vapor uh, is not enough uh, to dampen the cooling that's done by ozone. Uh, the ozone depletion, you, you, it's this stratospheric signal that we see emerging in late spring, like October, November, and then prop we see it manifesting itself down to the surface with cold anomalies. Uh, as you basically have cooled the stratosphere right at the beginning of when the sun comes up, and then uh, that, that signal penetrates down, and you see it in temperature, you see it in geopotential heights, they fall, and the winds strengthen, and the winds strengthening themselves give this dynamic feedback um, by locking in more polar air. It's like a tightening of the polar vortex, and so less mid-latitude air exchanges, systems travel more zonally, and so you don't have these strong cold fronts that move farther away and warm fronts that penetrate down. And so it does create this really cold continent uh, pattern, except for the peninsula. The peninsula behaves differently because it sticks out farther into the westerlies. And so the east and the west peninsula can behave quite differently, even with stronger cyclonic activity. So since you were just mentioning ozone, in your ozone forcing, kind of looks like at the end it maybe starts to come up a bit. I mean, a recovery? Yeah, um, it could be. It's that that's a challenge uh, in models because uh, ozone. The amount of ozone recovering a model depends on how you prescribe the greenhouse gases, and so which wins out is kind of model dependent, and um, and it's also how quickly do the greenhouse gases evolve, and because they're actually two competing things um, in terms of both dynamics and radiation. Uh, later on, though, the greenhouse recover the greenhouse. We expect the greenhouse gases to dominate that signature, but they're going to be competing each other for a little while. Um, Susan Solomon and other people that study the ozone hole suggest that we may see, we are starting to see recovery in the ozone hole now, um, but there's so much interannual variability, year to year variability, it's hard to know when it's bending back upward. Yeah. So, Ryan, I'm, I'm just thinking a little bit about the design of, of these experiments where for the good reasons that you mentioned, you know, you don't trust the higher latitude SST, so you're only changing them in this, this tropical band. If, if we assume that there's been maybe the globe has warmed by about a degree since the early 20th century, maybe the tropics it's about a half degree. If, you're, if you have a tropical mean warming of about a half degree that you're prescribing, but you're not prescribing any change in the high latitudes, you know, I could imagine maybe some kind of a Hadley cell response to having increased the pole to equator temperature gradient mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that might get imprinted on some of these results. Absolutely, yeah. So we're actually, in the tropical SST experiments, we're indirectly getting greenhouse forcing because the tropical SSTs are warming. And so that warming trend that we have um, is creating some indirect greenhouse forcing um, because of that warming trend. But, 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 but what's different about greenhouse forcing, sorry to interrupt, is that the high latitude response, of course, is, is larger yes. in the Arctic than the tropics. Yes. And in the Antarctic, it's probably smaller. So maybe in the Antarctic, it's a little bit more like the greenhouse yep. response. But, you know, I wonder if there would be a way to design an experiment where you preserve the variability in the tropics without changing the mean temperature. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's the challenge. Um, because we want to get the right timing and frequency of these ENSO events uh, historically because they're so critical to those teleconnections and the location of the convection and, and all these things that we can control to some extent by prescribing the tropical SSTs. But then we're getting this long-term drift, this trend. And part of the challenge with that reason why we're not seeing good matches in this, the winter and the spring is there is this large greenhouse signal in the model due to that tropical SST warming. Uh, and it's much larger than we think is um, it might be dampened in the real world by some of the changes in the circulation near Antarctica that we're not capturing in our simulations. Another challenge that we're seeing too is also not just the, the gradient from the tropics to the pole, but the east-west gradient of SSTs in the equatorial Pacific is crucial uh, for the magnitude and intensity of El Nino events and uh, all of these downstream teleconnections that we are, are knowing are so important for our climate. Uh, if that's slightly different, uh, even in a prescribed sense, that you know, can create some challenges. So as you go back into the time into the early 20th century, is that gradient accurately represented in, in the limited observations that we have in well, these data sets? Well, that's very controversial because mm -hmm. you have to, you, you've had sort of have the Lamont view of things that the eastern tropical Pacific is cooling relative to where it was in the early 20th century, but that's not necessarily reflected in, in all of the temperature temperature reconstruction. Absolutely. So that's pretty, that's yeah, tough even point. modern times it's, it's tough. It's even more when you go back yeah. into the other 20s. And, but that's so important for the evolution of these events. And that's a, another limitation. It's like we don't know how well that, that gradient, the equatorial east-west zonal gradient is. Yeah. Challenging. <clears throat> yeah, Phil. Can you review the uh, modern uh, negative pressure anomalies and how that like, feedback on the sea ice and everything that was uh, in your earlier slides. Can you just review how those are, some of these, these forces? Oh, sure. To the whole, uh, yeah. Let me uh, zoom out here. I was, I was following to the point of Okay, yeah, so uh, this is over a short time window, so it's, it's just like um, 18 years here, but they're, they're, they're fairly persistent. Uh, the, the biggest feature here is this uh, Amundsen sea low deepening, which we see in, in many seasons. This is the, the, the autumn season. Uh, whoops. And so a deepening low pressure here, warm air advection, and that leads to surface warming. You're bringing in more maritime air that we're seeing on the western peninsula in parts of West Antarctica. At the same time, it's pushing ice just by surface winds uh, towards the coast. And so it's compacting it and creating this ice albedo feedback, relieving more open warm water. And so some of the largest warming trends are actually on the Western Peninsula, like Faraday Station, because of that presence of open water, uh, where it used to be ice coverage in uh, the winter and the, the spring. So, uh, and then the last thing is the, this slight easterly flow here. Um, drives Ekman pumping. I'm not an oceanographer and I'm nervous talking in front of a lot of them, but uh, yeah, drives Ekman pumping, pumping that, sorry, to the left, uh, towards the, the inward here. So that pushes the circumpolar deep water up and into underneath these ice uh, shelves and uh, glaciers and melts the Amundsen Sea glaciers. And so it's this really interesting, you know, ice ocean atmosphere feedback here that's going on with this, driven largely by the atmospheric circulation. Yeah. Just one follow up on that same ice dynamics thing. So, is there is there a depth? I mean, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of the, you know, the Rob the the you know, talking about you know the, the downflow uh, and and this water being pumped in there. But is there a length scale at which the ice now is enough to cool that water below so that you don't get quite as much erosion? In other words, you're, you're lengthening out this. But I, I think that would be true. But I think that it keeps coming in. And so it doesn't, if it were to stop, you know, then yeah, you could essentially get an so equilibrium the state. Pump is circulating in yeah, the well, the cooling could, could ever, even no matter how far you went down there, you'd never be able to cool I, So I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm being videoed. I don't, I don't, don't want to, <laughs> like people at NASA to, to you know. <laughs> the, but uh, no, I think it's, it's also buoyancy sort of thing and uh, being pulled down, down slope and it, the winds helping to drive that at some level, um, continue to just 
funneled so below. It's really so it, it's very complicated. And so NSF is investing millions on this now with the Thwaites program. It's this really cool uh, collaborative between US scientists and both the British and Arctic Survey and, and, and really the UK uh, to investigate this from an ocean um, ice glaciological interface problem to understand if this is in fact irreversible and if so, how rapidly is it going to happen for sea level rise and what the, the global consequences of that would be. Yeah. It's very challenging. There's yeah. A, there's a huge buoyancy effect because of the fresh water. Yeah. At the grounding line. And there's also a, an angle to it. It doesn't just go straight up. It's, uh, it's yeah. Six. Well, the, other, the other thing about Mark's point is that even if the water does cool <coughs> off from sustained contact with the undersurface of the ice, the way it's doing that is by melting the ice. That's the only mechanism, right? It's giving up energy to be used yeah. to make heat and melting. Yeah, and since the makes the ice thin enough that it's just dynamically unstable, and so it just fractures, and then just creates these really big rifts or crevasses that just, you know, then can get a little bit of melt above them for whatever reason, and then shatter off. And so it happens fairly rapidly. Here? Yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. Is it coming out from that from that? Yeah, so good question. So this area where the, the black areas are and the significant wind trends are, yeah. we up until 2017, 2017 was a really weird sea ice year, we have been seeing sea ice gains in the Ross Sea sector. Uh, sea ice's extent has been increasing on equatorward, and yes, the ice edge has been moving farther. And you can ask anybody that's been involved with the U.S. Antarctic program, and the icebreaker has been having a hell of a time getting down there um, because just fast ice still in there, even late into summer, um, and, and more ice than normal um, during the field season. And so ice is formed where it's been pushed away from the continent? Yeah, there's a polynia here off of Terra Nova Bay that's a really good ice production region, and so it tends to get produced there and then pumped outward. And with the wind drift um, pushing it farther, the, uh, the surface winds pushing the ice and then allowing it to continue to expand and grow. Into the east release? Yeah, uh, yeah, it can, absolutely. So my, my current NSF project is now on sea ice and I'm collaborating with sea ice scientists at UCLA to attempt to reconstruct sea ice back into the 20th century. Um, and there, there I'm involving a, a Bayesian statistician at UCLA to do some really cool Bayesian modeling uh, that we can hope to do this at monthly or even sub-monthly time scales to get a really long record. I'm going to continue my linear methods and they're going to add on some really cool ensemble Bayesian approaches to getting sea ice back in through the 20th century that we can then use in climate models to have a much better constraint on earlier uh, sea ice conditions around Antarctica. Uh, yeah. All right, thank you guys so much.